Let me tell you something. We went out and laid down a fantastic podcast for you today, and you're going to know exactly why I said that if you tune into this authentic avenue. Fire clay tile makes the most beautiful tile in the world, no matter whether you're walking through LaGuardia or into your bathroom. And today, I have their CEO on the show. His name's Eric Edelson. And today, we talk all about, not just about how a neuroscientist gets into the tile world, but also how he took this company direct, how he reclaimed his brand, and how he over-indexes on caring for his team. We talk a good bit about that in the second half of the conversation today, specifically through ownership. More on that, plus being a B Corp and his thoughts on authenticity. But where I really thought this conversation went well was talking about the lumps that led to the eventually smoothed out path to the 200 person, $30 million revenue business that Fireclay is today. Because after all, Increasing ownership stakes to employees is not the easiest thing in the world to do, especially when investors are hungry for money. Uh, Firing all your customers is not the easiest thing to do when you write a three-page manifesto and have your own personal Jerry Maguire moment overnight. And Eric has done it all. So I really appreciated his insight today. And if you're part of an organization or have started an organization that you're hoping or thinking may undergo some sort of sea change, This is a good conversation to listen to. So as I said, we laid down something great. Now, listen to it with us. Check in as I get real with Fireclay Tile and Eric Edelson. Eric, how are you? Adam, I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Big fan and really excited to connect with you today. Big fan. Okay, good. That's Hey, that is a good way to lighten me up a little bit here at the front. Now, I had a bunch of questions anyway, but... um, now I'm going to talk about it much more positively. Thanks for doing that. Uh, first thing I want to ask, when we, we've chatted before, um, not on this show, listeners, we do do some prep here, all right? This isn't just off the cuff. You called yourself a big little company. What's up with that? And what, 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 can, you, can you explain that to me first? And then I want to figure out how a neuroscientist gets into tile. But I, I, uh, let's start with that first wave that you described when we first spoke. Yeah, we're, I mean, I, I still consider us a, a little company uh, as it relates to revenue profitability we're we're about a 30 million dollar revenue business so uh so you know decent size but still small in the the grand scheme of things but we're a very big company in terms of we have over 200 full-time teammates we are 100 percent vertically integrated so you know we make and sell everything that we do uh and everything we do is made to order uh so it's quite complex with lots of moving pieces and uh and so it feels very big and complicated for for the size of business we have. So that's that's a that's why I always like to say we're we're both we're a small big company. Got it. Okay. So you're operating like a large company with a large company mentality and with with the growth to eventually get there but simply not at that. Okay, that makes sense. That that's basically what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we it's also a reflection of our industry as one where so much of the infrastructure we need to have today to sell and market for projects tomorrow requires us to to almost look bigger, act bigger, and have more capabilities. Uh, so many of our lead times uh, could be up to three years. So so we have to look like we're going to be three years from now in order to win those projects and have a chance at those. So we actually have to invest so much more in infrastructure up front to be able to to sell and, and produce that product later. So so it's yeah, a variety of factors, but because we're the manufacturer. We're also a brand and the retailer. You know, we almost have three different businesses all all in one. Right, but you got to act a certain way. I mean, not everybody who strolls into LaGuardia and gets to tile it up. So I understand you got to have right. that image. Yes, yes. It's kind of like in that movie uh, uh, in Jurassic Park. There's a wonderful scene where the T Rex is chasing uh, the the car that's driving away, and it says, you know, objects and mirror may be closer than they appear. And I I always I always kind of joke about that in the sense that like we just have to like look a lot bigger than we are. Uh, so you know, fake it till you make it. It's always it's always presenting an image of of much more sophistication, much more us having everything totally fitting together and working, even though internally, yeah, I mean things are really good, but it can be uh, it can be daunting and and lots of little challenges. But to the end user to the end consumer, it looks fantastic and it feels great. Right. And hey, there's really no faking it here. Listeners, when I said LaGuardia, that wasn't, I didn't make that up. That's because if you go to LaGuardia and you look at some of the tile work, 
that's Eric. That's Fireclay. If you go to Salesforce's Global HQ, that's Fireclay. I mean, this is not, I mean, th- these guys are acting much bigger than the, than the, the little company that Eric advertised up front. So, so let me, let me brush his shoulders off for just a second. But then the next thing I want to ask Eric is about you personally, because you have this neuroscience background. You were, you were in the world of biotech investing. Doesn't seem to me to like line up like the, that has to be a lot of grout between those two tiles. Can you help tell me how you got across to this side of your life? Yeah. And, and great, great tile reference there. So, Appreciate and I should that, probably yeah. just tee it up. I mean, so, you know, for your listeners, uh, uh, fire clay tile, we make the world's most beautiful tile. We do that, uh, here in the United States and California. Uh, so we make uh, tile for residential and commercial projects. Everything we do is made to order, and it could be for a small fireplace surround or for, as you mentioned, a 30,000 square foot custom uh, installation for LaGuardia Airport or uh, companies like Salesforce and, and Facebook and more. So so that's what we do. And uh, I've been here for 13 years, and you're right. I My background in many ways has nothing to do with it. And of course, in every way, it has everything to do with it. I uh, I grew up in the DC area. I was always a very competitive athlete, very committed to academics. And uh, went to college. I say neuroscience. Mostly, I, I, I like to say it was it was an excuse of, of not really knowing what I wanted to do. So neuroscience really combined biology and physics and chemistry and math and and a wide variety of subjects, and uh, uh, and kind of fit into this 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 major of neuroscience. Um, but but really, it was just I just didn't quite know what I wanted to do, and that even continued to uh, when I got my MBA. I graduated without a, without a job. I was one of you know maybe. 15 out of 400 without a job. Again, not quite knowing what I wanted to do. And, uh, and you know, all, all my past ultimately led to meeting the founder of Fireclay and, and, uh, and finding this company that at the time was, was very small. Uh, when I say very small, it was just about 20 people back then, about a million and a half dollars in revenue uh, and, and didn't have a lot of systems or infrastructure. And so it just felt like a, an incredible opportunity to help build an organization and, and to, to eventually lead a company and, and grow it immensely. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been somewhat of a, of a strange route. But, you know, when I kind of like go back in history, a lot of it, of course, fits together. Uh, so happy to get more into it. But that's that was that was a bit, a bit of my journey. Yeah, well, I appreciate that because, you know, it's not every day that you get that sea change, although now that you explain it. It does make sense how you would get there. But you continued to engineer this business even after you showed up. And I was reading some other media on you where you described this Jerry Maguire moment where you decided that you had to do something radically different with Fireclay, specifically to turn it direct and to fire all your customers. Now, that seems like an interesting way to grow a business. Would you mind describing that? Yeah, so most of uh, the tile industry works in a very traditional manner, which is you have manufacturers and, and those manufacturers are very global in nature. I mean, actually only about 30% of the tile consumed in the United States is, is produced in the United States. So most of it comes from China or Italy, Spain, Brazil, India. Uh, so you have manufacturers who are selling through distribution or to, to retail and retail could be anyone from Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, but in our world, which is more of a, of a higher end, uh, more kind of a custom made product, it's it's typically either smaller uh, mom and pop or kind of independent tile stores uh, in various cities. There's there's a few that might kind of um, have more of a brand name, maybe have fifteen or twenty stores, but it's very regional. Um, but that's that's really typically how this world works. And and Fireclay was in a category of art tile companies. These are typically quite small companies, you know, maybe up to fifty or hundred people, maybe a couple million bucks in revenue. Who you know simply produced product and sold it to these retailers, and so when I got to Fireclay in 2009, that was the business model. We had a small showroom in San Jose where we did a little bit of our own retail, but I spent uh, basically four years between 2009 and 2013 trying to resurrect the company in these retailers, trying to do everything we could to convince them to put us on their shelf, sell the product, and you know honestly, we just got uh, rejected left and right. It was such a struggle. We would uh, get into a store, but then they would ask us for their own unique um, boards or, or product that was different from maybe someone else down the street, or they would want um, exclusivity. And, and so it was just a very fragmented group. It was very hard to sell into. And ultimately, we were just one of, you know, a, a hundred different vendors on a wall. And so 
just from a math standpoint, the probability of us being selected by a customer was very low. And so, you know, some, sometimes you have that, that motto of like, if you can't win the game, like start playing a different game uh, or, or find a new field. And so what ultimately happened was out of this just rejection of not being able to win in this wholesale market, um, we, we had this vision and, and you're exactly right. It was a Jerry Maguire moment. I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, got to my computer at 4 a.m. Uh, on a Saturday morning. It was February uh, 16th, 2013. We wrote a three-page manifesto of how we needed to build our own brand and go direct. I sent it to my partner, Fireclays founder, and his reply was, sounds good. And uh, within three months, we had raised $800,000 from friends and family. And uh, within the next nine months, by January 6, 2014, relaunched our company, fired all of our wholesale customers, and felt like we, if we didn't take this moment right now to go direct and earn our keep, build our brand, create the best possible customer experience for tile consumers, um, then, then we, would, we would just never win. We would never grow. And so... That, that was the journey. It was really out of rejection and, you know, kind of doing everything we could to grow our brand in, in that other channel um, that we found this path to being truly vertically integrated, going direct. And, uh, and it's been amazing ever since. What did the team think of that? I mean, because when you tell the story, looking back, it's easy to say, well, I wrote this manifesto when we raised, you know, nearly a million dollars and we went direct and it was fantastic, happily ever after. But like there had to have been some lumps in that story. What were the biggest challenges to going direct once that manifesto was on the table and the the pencil was still smoking? I mean, like what was what was the grit you had to get through? Yes, at the time the team was actually quite small still. So, you know, we might have been about 40 people, but the majority of those people would have been in, would have been in production. I had actually just hired a new uh, uh, person to lead sales for us who had had about 40 years experience in the industry. And I'd hired him to really build our wholesale channel. So I think it was his second month where we went out to lunch and I said, you know, I know that we just hired you to do all of this, but we're going to not do any of that. <laughs> and he was a great sport. I mean, he had been in the industry forever and, you know, he actually just thought it was a tremendous idea and just wanted to know what he could do to help. Uh, so, you know, internally, it wasn't as much convincing. I think, you know, the challenge was that we didn't have money. We had to convince a lot of, we had to convince a few people to give us money. And a lot of people thought we were crazy. Uh, we, no one had really done what we were trying to do. I mean, there was certainly precedent for selling, you know, consumer products online. And we were inspired by brands like Bonobos and Trunk Club and, um, and Stitch Fix and others who were going more direct, but, you know, to be a manufacturer and to go direct, uh, in tile, tile, such a tactile product, there's so many different options. There's a lot of variation with tile, you know, all of those things were a lot of um, friction points in, in places people thought. We wouldn't have success, so so we really didn't know how it would go. Um, so I think a lot of it was, frankly, just you know trying to not necessarily convince the existing team, but bring together people um, who we didn't have on the team, hire people uh, to you know kind of launch this company in a way that we hadn't done it before. The the big challenge that was actually in the early days, it was incredibly fun. It was so intoxicating. It was like just it was so fun to be so creative. The hard part actually came you know a year or two later which was as, as the sales and brands started to take off, the manufacturing side, um, trying to keep up, trying to scale production, especially with uh, the complexity of ceramics, it's a pretty unforgiving craft and the customization and the sheer number of uh, kind of skew uh, components that we have, color, size, combinations, volume, that was actually very, very challenging. That, that caused a lot of challenges in, in some of our early years. That took a while to get through. So, you know, I think scaling not just the brand, not just the sales organization and the marketing team, but also the manufacturing all together without very much money, because we were still quite small at this time without uh, a lot of cash, that that was very, very difficult. But over time, that ended up being the right decision. Absolutely. And that Best team, decision ever. That, and good, because I want to ask about it, because <laughs> that team has grown to several hundred people that brand has taken off as you've noted. Now it's on that point that I, I want to chat a little bit more about the way that Fireclay is structured because it is an outlier to me. I haven't heard of it very often. And listeners, I'll tell you what I mean. So first off, I've been to one other ceramics factory in my life, which I, I know as you noted on our pre-call, uh, over-indexes me like among the, yes. the society. All right. So 
suffice it to say, uh, that plant that I was uh, walking through uh, did not produce uh, consumer products. I mean, this was all this is all like components for for things that people use every day. But it didn't strike me as a place where even if it were consumer facing, you could build an incredible brand with lots of smiling faces and stories. I mean, these were tough. These were tough guys operating these kilns, operating at thousands of degrees, like in fear of getting their fingers chopped off every day. And yet you have put this face on fire clay, which despite needing to work that hard job, still presents itself to the consumer as this, this beautiful end product. Really, that's what they see, although it's not all they see. I, I will talk about what you do on Factory Fridays in just a bit. But the care for the team doesn't just extend to the way that you portray it. It extends to the way in which you are a patron of it. And so from there, I want to talk about ownership stakes because you over-index here, which is the benefit in the return of capital to your own employees. Can you explain how it over-indexes and how you got to that decision? Yeah, absolutely. I actually think some of this comes down to just the, the theme of your podcast, which is authenticity. And if you actually go back to the history of Fire Clay, it started with four founders. And over time, one of those founders, kind of the original founder, the main founder, bought the other three out. I eventually partnered with him. And today, we actually have a, a pretty kind of wide ownership between um, kind of me and, and the original founder, and our employees, and uh, and investors. And so when I say authentic, it's like my view is that ownership is never fixed. It's very reflective of um, you know where you're trying to get to, and it can be very complicated. But ultimately, you know, ownership is an incredible, valuable tool to um, reward people for their effort. And so at Fireclay, uh, you know, one of the biggest appeals I had early on was was equity and ownership. And so me and the founder actually, on a handshake, agreed to me earning 25% uh, ownership in the business over several years. And we literally actually didn't sign a legal document for four plus years. It was really just trust in a handshake, which I would not recommend to others, um, but but is a testament to, to our founder and um, to the trust that we have in each other. And uh, uh, over time, uh, he, his role actually kind of started to uh, decrease and the responsibility had, that he had decreased. And uh, I saw an opportunity to reward our teammates and those people who were creating new value in the company. So, you know, kind of long story short, ownership has iterated quite often at Fireclay. Um, and today we are 30% teammate owned or employee owned. Um, and, and that's something that has been very important to me. We first introduced ownership through a stock option plan to our employees in 2013, when we raised money from outside investors, we increased that into two, in 2015. Um, and then we, um, did a buyout of our founder last year, which allowed us to take our teammate ownership to, to this 30% level. So, you know, it's, it's been one of these things where I've been, I always wanted to work for equity. I wanted ownership. I wanted upside. And so. You know, shame on me if I didn't try to create those same opportunities for everyone else who worked for me. Um, because if that's inspiring to me, I should be able to inspire others in that same way. I also think it's an incredible way to create wealth. I think, you know, we always talk about three forms of compensation at Fireclay, which is your base pay uh, bonus. We do a, a year-end bonus every year, which is which is quite sizable for our team. And and ownership. And we ultimately want to grow this company. We have investors, so we we do want to sell this company one day. And uh, when we do that, we want to make sure that our teammates who helped us get us there have a, a huge outcome in that. So, so that's really kind of the the history and and uh, and how it's worked. It certainly have has had uh, lots of complexities. It takes work, uh, but it's very doable, and it's been um, huge for us. I, I think our employees are still figuring out what it all means, um, but uh, it's there. It's theirs, and um, I'm very confident that over time. Uh, it's it's gonna be something that they really do come to appreciate. They come to understand it better, and I do think it it very much contributes to our culture. We have an incredible team. We have high retention. A lot of people want to come work at Fireclay, and I think I think certainly that adds to it for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure it out a little bit, just because I, I haven't heard of a pool that large in terms of ratio of the equity pool for employees. And I've said I've worked in the startup space and the tech world for a while, so I know the value of it, but it is just not abnormal, just a little unorthodox. So it makes me wonder what these 
investors said. I mean, if I'm sitting there standing to gain maybe a bit of this equity share back on investment that I've already made when a co-founder or a founder walks away, and then you know, you come in and say, well, I'd rather just give this to the employees. Like, I'm sure they're thinking like, hey, I mean, I know this guy went to high school with the president's daughter, but he's not the leader that he thinks he is. This guy might have gotten one perfect score in the Maryland Math League 25 years ago, but these numbers don't add up. Like, what, how did you get through those conversations? I understand there must have been some heated arguments there. It's like people letting go of their money. It's very hard to separate somebody from their money. Yeah. Well, you, you, you brought up something. So, yes, I did, I did go to high school with Chelsea, who's, who's an incredible woman. Um, and, and what's interesting is that that high school was actually a Quaker high school. And, you know, so much of, I think my values come from that Quaker education, um, being raised in a Jewish household. Uh, so, so generosity, commitment to the community, those are, those are like very important values to me. Uh, you know, I'm a very math driven person. I, I did work in the venture capital and finance world. Um, I do have a business degree. So, so the math actually checked out quite clearly. From my my standpoint, uh, it it certainly involved quite a long discussion with our we have a board of directors, um, with our investors, and um, but we are a certified B Corp, and I know you've had other B Corps on your show. I have. When you're a certified benefit corporation, uh, you you have made a commitment to all stakeholders, and and we take that commitment very seriously, and because we're a certified benefit corporation, our board and investors understand that the decisions we make are not always going to be purely profit driven. And so because we have that alignment, because we have that buy-in, uh, there has been a common language and a shared set of values and alignment to help us make decisions like this. So when I come to them with this proposal for, you know, a radical increase in teammate ownership, you know, it was a 10 page proposal with supporting financial model. Uh, there was a negotiation. This was not like a, you know, it took nine months to, for us to, to align and get there. It did not just happen overnight. So, you know, there was a lot of back and forth, but uh, certainly for, for my leadership, you know, this is something I was very committed to. And uh, I do believe it's going to be a win, win, win for everyone. Absolutely. Well, good. And I, I, I thought to ask about that because like I perhaps am overly cynical about what an investor would want uh, mm -hmm. out of their investment. And my guess is that, you know, those, those negotiations took, you know, a, a, a little bit of time and that it, it wasn't easy street, but that's, this is the work that you have to put in if you are going to carve your own authentic avenue. Listeners, I, I talk about this a lot. It's like, what are you not willing to back down on? What are you going to lean into extra hard? What aligns with the values of your organization? In this case, it was returning as much value to the team as possible. And you mentioned the generosity that makes up your the, the fiber of sort of your, your moral being and the education that led you to that. The education that has led me in the experiences where I've had to build and curate teams over time is uh, the, the Jesuit practice of education. So I, mm -hmm. I also grew up in the DC, or I grew up in Baltimore. So I went to a Jesuit high school and their driving, I mean, they had many statements and, 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 and mottos. One of them was the idea of, of cure personalis. This is, you know, translated roughly to care of the whole person, but it's, you know, making sure that you are nourishing yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, like in, in every sense of the word. And yep. so I think I see a bit of that in what you do with this team, because yeah. I went to your website and, and listeners, this is a true story. I got this opportunity to talk with Eric. I immediately go to the website. And I say, well, let me just look at the team page to see like, who, who are the leaders? You know, who's Eric? Who's this guy? Right. So I scroll down and you can go there yourself, listeners. I mean, this guy must have every freaking team member on this page with like a lengthy bio for everybody. He's telling everybody's story. Everybody is truly central to this. And that's also an over-indexed thing. I've never seen that before. I asked him about his benefits. He's got benefits. He, he displays them publicly. So like... I, like this is a really strong show of of care and that generosity. So 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 kudos to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ways in which you like nourish your talent over time? As we described earlier, you have about two hundred employees now. I mean, what are you doing to keep them at their best? I don't think we've always been great at this. I, I think this is something we're getting better at, and we're we're working to improve here. Uh, so I I think that we've always had a strong culture of 
we call it goddess. Goddess is one of our core values. It's all, it's a Spanish word for desire and heart. And, and we talk about the goddess culture at Fire Clay. There's always been a very strong work ethic at Fire Clay. There's always been a very strong commitment to the craft. And that has been very much shared by all. So, so everyone's always been all in and that's been very core. I think with regard to developing talent, we very much has lo have looked to promote from within. So five of our six members of our leadership team are people who have grown up within the organization. If you look at our, our managers, you would see uh, probably 75% promoted from within. So we always are looking internally. Um, we're definitely bringing in outside talent, but, but we're giving people internally opportunities to grow and develop. Um, over the last few years, we've gotten much better at this. We've really solidified our people department. We now have a full-time leading and development specialist. Uh, we are working on you know, performance management, performance reviews, compensation management. Um, we do a lot around, we're just hyper transparent. So everyone knows everything. Uh, we share uh, everything in the organization, except we don't share everyone's salary and we don't share everyone's ownership. But outside of that, like everyone knows how much cash we have in the bank. They know how much money we're making every single month. They know everything. And uh, so, so I, I think it's always been like an organization where we've all been all in. Uh, I think we're doing a better job now of creating like structure and support systems to to nourish and develop people. But it's never been something historically we weren't great at. Like one of the areas we were terrible at was developing managers. Um, so we were typically just like put someone in a management role and say like high five, good luck. That that was not great, <laughs> so I would not recommend that. Uh, the last few years, we've really tried to strengthen that. We have a, a Ghanis, we call it our Ghanis team. We have monthly sessions, we do training, we do book clubs, um, we do Manager 101. I teach a class on the business of fire clay where I spend several hours with all teammates to actually educate them on like our business and how we make money and like why why we do the things that we do. So, so we're doing a much better job now of giving managers tools to have success as managers, but but I don't think it's always been the thing we've been best at. I think that our culture has always been good, uh, but preparing people for success development, that's something we're now spending a lot more time and energy in that uh, we should have we should have honestly done more earlier. Well, it's interesting to even to, to hear that. And of course, to have, to have that humility to be like, well, look at them. We weren't always, you know, this this forward about it, but it's good that you've gotten there and it's so obvious now that you care deeply about it. Um, let me ask you one more question before I, I turn to the advice column, which I always do at the end of these, um, which is about that A word that I, that I love, authenticity. Yeah. You, um, you, you, you state or you told me that it's important, especially these days, especially now for um, people to reclaim their brand. Now you went through this several years ago when you, as you said, fired all your customers and you, you, you described yourself and maybe you can explain what you meant as a manufacturer encumbered by retail. And you went to this state of, I guess, being unencumbered. And, and now you, you, you proclaim today that like other brands should do that. Uh, can you explain more about what, what you mean there and, and why there's such a, a hindrance when you tie yourself to another player? Yeah, we, um, listen, I, I, I have no doubt that some manufacturers must be phenomenal at just, you know, going all in and supporting retail. Um, I, I think for us, the the retail channel was was very limiting for us. Um, it was a very fragmented channel. There was no loyalty. There were there were so many different players who wanted so many different things. It was it was really impossible. And, and especially in what I'll call the artisan world, the 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 you know kind of custom uh, made to order world. And this could be anything from you know I, my world is really like interiors, design, um, building materials. I've just I've come across so many makers who just can't grow because their margins are so terrible. Uh, what they're being asked for from retailers is so hard. Uh, the payment terms from a cash flow management are excruciating. You know, net thirty, but really you're paid at like sixty days. Uh, you know, it's it's just not you're not set up for success. And so here we are in a world where social media is incredible influencers are the new PR and the ability to show your work, to show how you produce it, it's never been more available. And customers want this. Consumers want to know who they're buying from. They want to know the company that they're purchasing from. They want to know their values. They want to know what they're supporting. And so to be able to really kind of connect yourself to the consumer has never been more possible than today. 
Uh, and so, yeah, we're constantly trying to inspire manufacturers, support manufacturers to say, get yourself out there, like connect directly with customers because it's going to create the best experience, going to create the best end product. Uh, and, and it's just, it's so much more fun. So, I mean, it's not really, I, I don't really want to knock retail. There certainly is a value for retail, but for, for what we do, especially in the kind of high end custom world, uh, to be able to work directly with customers, it's, it's so intoxicating. It's so much better for everybody. There's fewer mistakes. Lead times are faster. Everything is better. Uh, the experience, the value for the end user is better. Cash flow cycles, management for our, our team, ability for us to support our team is so much better. So it's just been a win, win, win across the board. Uh, so yeah, we, we definitely are trying to inspire manufacturers to go direct and, uh, and for customers to really ask more questions about where their product's coming from, who made it. Uh, and, and by doing so, we think, we think that's going to create a lot more value um, for, for everyone. Well, I've seen a lot of folks in manufacturing broadly, it doesn't really matter what they're making, uh, go for this to, to, to go direct. I mean, you know, you did this around, when, when was this again? In 2013, 2014, right? When you went direct? Yeah, exactly. Well, DTC was like not even a, a, an acronym that was in people's heads at that time. And yeah. so you were certainly ahead of that time, but I know it's happening a lot today. And so, yes, of course, no, uh, <laughs> no hate to the wonderful partners that make manufacturers what they are. But yes, I, I think that that is a, a very interesting way to, to continue a growth trajectory. Um, so with all of this in mind, I got to ask as we close, I do it with everybody. I ask them how they carve their own path to authenticity and how others might. The reason I do that is simple because most of my listeners like emulate the paths of those that appear here. And that word is so freaking broad. I mean, I call this authentic avenue because I believe there are myriad paths to achieve that word, to manifest it. And uh, the stories to get there are endless. And so given the fact that we've just gone over yours for like roughly the last half hour, how would you, like what learnings have you picked up or teachings can you give to help somebody else do their own thing authentically, whether it be in, in tile or not, but, um, heat up the kiln for us. If you could, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're killing it with your tile references. I'm trying, I'm, so I'm trying so hard. I, yeah. <laughs> no, I've never heard anyone do it as well. It's fantastic. Um, so, uh, when I think about authenticity, I, I think it's, it's so much about staying true to your core values and, and, you know, as they say, doing, doing the right thing when no one's looking and what's, what I think is even more important today around that is also being accountable to it. Um, I think the word authenticity is thrown around a lot and, and then it's not really substantiated. And so I think in this world, customers, consumers, employees, they, they don't want to just hear it. They want to see it. And so being accountable, dream, being transparent, uh, living it, proving it, demonstrating it, I, I think is I think it's so, it's so important. I don't think you can just sit there and say, these are our core values or this is how we're authentic. You got to show people, you have to, you have to prove it. You have to live it. Uh, that's, that to me is, is the sweet spot today of authenticity. It's, it's doing the right thing when no one's looking and, and demonstrating that you're doing the right thing when no one's looking, because there's so much skepticism in the world. Uh, trust is low <laughs> right now, especially to, for for-profit companies. So we need to we need to rebuild that trust. We need to give customers, consumers, our employees the information so that we're not just talking the talk, but we're walking the walk. Sure, even when nobody is paying attention to the walk that you're walking, you know, but to make sure that you that integrity is there is quite important. Yeah. Um, I appreciate hearing your story here, and for you to be so open about it about the various things that. I think you all over index on caring, caring for the team, you know, um, making sure we didn't, we didn't even get to factory Fridays, but li listeners, I'll leave <laughs> links to, to let you see that essentially what they're doing the best. on Instagram is they're, they're giving a live look in at what they're actually like producing, like on the production floor, but they get like hundreds of thousands of people to watch this. And that might seem strange to you. It's like what, a hundred, couple hundred thousand people are watching a factory. Yeah, they are. And you need to go figure out why, because I think it's a really well done way to portray an industry, which shall we say otherwise can seem kind of dry, but not here. Um, for all of this, Eric, it's been a pleasure. And uh, listeners, if you're going to like redo your home at some point, or if you have an office, frankly, tell your boss to call this guy up uh, and get yourself, uh, get yourself a fresh look. Uh, but for now, Eric, thank you so much for joining me. And I was really glad to chat with you. Thank you, Adam. Keep up the great work. Really appreciate the opportunity to share. You know, something at the end there I want to point out because we talk about walking the walk and talking the talk. 
a lot on this show. It's a great way to manifest authenticity, to actually do what you're saying and let your actions speak louder than your words. But to do that when no one is looking adds a layer of integrity that I wonder if everybody does because it's, it's easy to do a couple of big actions and market the hell out of them. But to truly embody something, even when no one else is around, is uh, corporate speaking, is important. And I think that Eric has done this via the care he's made for the team. And I encourage you to go check out everything Fire Clay does, even if you're not interested in remodeling your house. I think this is just a good leader and a good story to emulate. So Eric, thanks for coming on the show. And listeners, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Here's where else you can find me. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Okay. Authentic Avenue is the page. Adam Connor is my personal page. AuthenticAvenueMedia.com is where you can find all the podcasts. And you can also write me at Adam at AuthAv, A-U-T-H-A-V-E.com to tune in. If you have an idea for who should be on this show, if you have an idea for what Eric's doing or, or have a thought on what he was saying, I'd be happy to hear it. And I'd be happy to share my expertise in this podcast world too, but that's a far secondary thing. For now, I'm going to go and try and lay down another great episode for you. And until then, I'm your host, Adam Connor, saying until the next time I get real again with you, thanks for taking a walk with me down today's tile-laden Authentic Avenue.